Before the modern era, there can have been no other age that went to such lengths to supply water to the cities as the Roman period. The water conduits of the Roman Empire stretched for many kilometers, sometimes in underground channels, sometimes overground in stone-built aqueducts. On occasion, these aqueducts had to cross valleys and ravines, and so mighty bridges had to be built. The highest surviving aqueduct of this kind, standing almost 50 meters high, is the Pont du Gard in southern France. With its three levels and 64 round arches, it's one of the master achievements of ancient construction. Yet, when it was built in the first century AD, it served merely as a water conduit across the Gardon River. We don't know the name of the Pont du Gard's master builder, but over one arch in the middle of the aqueduct, traces have been discovered of a carved figure, perhaps a workman or an architect. However, it's scarcely possible now to determine what this image cut in stone might represent. The builders of Roman aqueducts were often military engineers with skills centuries ahead of those who came after them. In the days of the Emperor Augustus, Nîmes was an important town, Nemasus, and as in so many towns of the empire, those who lived there wanted the same standards of comfort and hygiene as in Rome, and so they decided on an aqueduct. The Romans looked for a water supply in the vicinity and located a spring 20 kilometers away where a small river, the Eure, rose. The supply of water was ample all year round and the spring lay 17 meters higher than the town, a useful engineering consideration. There could be no question of a perfectly straight conduit to Nemausus though. There were rock faces and outcrops in the way, and the steep valley of the Gardon would have to be crossed. In order to circumvent the natural obstacles, the Romans constructed a supply line almost 50 kilometers long. This stone line crossing the countryside can still be clearly seen. Today, this conduit would doubtless excite little comment, though, were it not for the famous aqueduct spanning the river Gardon. Over its entire length, the conduit had to drop an average of 25 centimeters in altitude per kilometer. To accomplish that, given the instruments then available, was an extraordinary feat. The Romans brought it off by building a whole series of arched constructions designed to counteract the effect of dips and valleys. The water was directed along stone channels into cisterns where the level could be regulated. The aqueducts that bridged watercourses were solidly built to resist the impact of floods. The Romans variously dug a channel in the ground or conducted their watercourse through tunnels hewn out of rock. Just a few hundred meters downriver, French archaeologists located where the huge blocks of stone used for the Pont du Gard, some of them more than two cubic meters, were quarried by the Romans. Every stone must have been cut to measure, because even for the arches, the Romans used no mortar at all. 
Stones that protrude at intervals from the masonry served as supports for wooden scaffolding or cranes. The builder of the Pont du Gard allowed some interesting irregularities in its 64 arches. Towards the river banks on either side, the diameters of the arches on the lower two levels grow smaller. The great arches span anything from 15 to more than 24 meters, while on the top level, though the thickness of the supports varies, the arches are all identical in diameter. It is this top level, 275 meters long, that actually carries the water conduit. The masonry was faced with plaster on the outside, and for the channel within, the Romans used their own kind of waterproof concrete. A mixture of burnt limestone, sand, water and broken tiles was used for the actual centre conduit that channelled water across the Pont du Gard. Despite everything, the architect made an error in calculating the drop in height. The drop was less on the bridge, which meant the water pressure rose and the water slopped over the walls. The Romans had no choice but to add an extra 46 centimetres height to the conduit. At the first test run, the entire aqueduct must have been drenched. The water took between 24 and 30 hours to flow the entire 50 kilometers from the spring to its destination, Roman Nemausus. A system of water pipes fanned out across the whole town, supplying wells, bathhouses and latrines, as well as many private homes with running water. The aqueduct ended above the town at a distributor system from the circular openings in which the water mains led off. Three holes in the ground served to flush away the town sewage. Every inhabitant of Nemausus had access to as much as 400 litres of water a day, more than twice the amount we use in today's developed cities. On the inside of the conduit, the flowing water gradually deposited calcium encrustations as much as 50 centimetres thick. The layers of these deposits show that the aqueduct was in use for more than 400 years. With the fall of the Roman Empire, the aqueduct was no longer of importance. Various conquerors ravaged the region, laying waste the town of Nîmes more than once. After a while, there were so few people living there that it wasn't worth repairing the water conduit. In due course, the aqueduct was stripped of many stones for reuse. What had once been a vital water supply served later generations as a quarry for building material. The Pont du Gard was spared this fate only because it was useful as a bridge. In order that horse-drawn vehicles could cross, though, the supports on the second level were hollowed out to the extent that the whole edifice threatened to fall down. If the Pont du Gard has survived, it's partly because a road bridge was built right next to it in the 18th century. The Roman aqueduct was hailed as a monument and the support columns filled in once again. The solid, enduring construction of the Pont du Gard has made it a place of pilgrimage for architects, engineers and builders. Some of them carved their names in the stone, perhaps as a sign of respect for the Roman master who built the aqueduct. Some of the ancient world's methods of construction were forgotten for centuries, and to this day, it's a rare thing to go to such lengths to supply a town with water.